to see you again. Last time you were here, you were six months pregnant. I was. You How old is she now? She's now three and a half. Hello everyone, that was just to give you context on what we'll be talking about today. And we are going to be talking a little bit about how feminists do not understand Disney films. And as we've seen here, Keira Knightley has a three and a half year old daughter. And she's going to tell her what she doesn't let her do. Um, so she's three years old, what is she into? And she, she wants to know, she already knows what she wants to be, right? Yeah, I mean, it's changed. She, she did want to be a dentist, which I was super happy about, because I thought, you know, that's a stable career. What got her into dentistry? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think that she, Peppa Pig. Peppa Pig, you know Peppa oh, Pig? Oh, sure, yes. That here? Yeah, yeah, that was a okay. dentist episode. She wanted to be a dentist. All right. Pe whatever. I'd like to point out at this point that the... <laughs> the dentist in this particular episode of Peppa Pig was actually a man who happened to be an elephant, but he was still a man. So I want to point out at this point that clearly the daughter can understand that not only men do jobs in shows that show men doing jobs. So her daughter's obviously a clever girl, which is good. Now she wants to be a lion. Oh. <laughs> Which I think is slightly more problematic. Yeah, not a but good she living. she roars very well. Yes, uh, is yeah. that what she's practicing, roaring? Very much so. Right, but no, what if she would want to be in this business? Would you, would you like that, or does it matter to you if she wants to be in this business? I am going to support her in anything that she wants to do. That's the right thing to do. A little tricky wanting to be a lion, but, but, yeah. Yeah, but yes, no, she's allowed to do whatever she wants. Yeah. Yes, yes, big clap. You're a very good parent. So obviously she supports her in whatever she wants to do. But she is going to completely destroy her own narrative on this in about now. And uh, she's banned from seeing certain uh, children's movies. Ah, uh, yes. She is allowed to do whatever she wants apart from watch children's films. Now, I know I'm being a bit disingenuous here, but honestly, like, I get the feeling that she wants her to do whatever she wants, but, you know... Obviously, if she's banned from watching children's films, which are films made for her, then I doubt that in later in life, Kira is actually going to let her child do whatever she wants, if you can't even watch a basic film. But her reasoning behind this is why I titled this video, Feminists Don't Understand Disney Films. And uh, she's banned from seeing certain uh, children's movies, right? Yeah. What are they? Cinderella. Mm -hmm. Banned. Uh, because, you know, she, she waits around for a rich guy to rescue her. Don't. Rescue yourself, right. obviously. Right. Yes, I think you rather misunderstand the point of Cinderella. Yes, no, it wasn't about having a rich guy come save herself. It was about having a fairy godmother allow her one good night <laughs> outside of her shitty and, quite frankly, awful life with her stepsisters or stepmothers, whatever it was. <laughs> like, she had an awful life and had absolutely no chance of saving herself, apart from with a bit of help from a fairy godmother. The prince just happened to be the type of person that she wants to be with, and then eventually he fell in love with her, and eventually they ended up marrying each other. He helped her out of a terrible situation, and if you really think that in your privileged life you ever need to see Cinderella, anything you can do without it, then I'm afraid you're sadly mistaken, because the point of it was that no matter what situation you are in, you sometimes may need help, sometimes you can get yourself out of there if you make the right decisions. That was the point. And this is the one that I'm quite annoyed about because I really like the film, but, uh, but Little Mermaid. I mean, the songs are great, but do not give your voice up for a man. Hello? I don't want anyone here to tell me at what point she actually gave her voice up for the man. I have to remind people here that there is a whole song about how she can't talk and that he literally wants her to talk so that he can get to know her because he wants her to talk and doesn't want just a feeble old housewife for him for the rest of his life. He wants someone he can love and get on with. That was the whole point. She gave up her voice so that she didn't have to be trapped under the water, under the sea, if you will, with her tyrannical father who won't let her go exploring. And she had to make pretty stupid decisions with an overbearing mother type archetype. Yes, this is from Mr. Peterson's train of thought, which I agree with. But she had to give her voice up with Ursula to then get legs to go on the ground, but be at a disadvantage there. And the whole point of that story is to show that if you want to go out there exploring, you are always going to be at a disadvantage, and even more so if you have tyrannical people around you. And it's probably best to get out of there, because you will probably find people who are good enough to help you. That is the whole point, not to give your voice up for a man. God, give me a break. You know, I mean, but, but the problem with, I mean, The Little Mermaid, I love The Little Mermaid, so I'm having that, that one's a little tricky one, but...
Yes, well, the reason with that is more than the songs. It's because it speaks to you on a level that you understand. Behind that story is a big old truth that you, like, your head can't understand on its own. So the story helps you understand it. The whole point is that you should try and resist and get away from tyrannical people in your life and go towards people who are there willing to help you, which is exactly what the prince wanted to do. But the thing is, because you're what I assume is a feminist, given you're in Hollywood and making these talking points, I know you don't understand this. And the thing is, is that these films are probably some of the most important films that her daughter is ever going to watch, and she's just completely banning them, meaning that her understanding of the world is going to be miles behind people that have actually watched them. And the thing is, I've never actually watched Disney films, but I know the stories, and I've seen other films like it that send off the same story, just not to the level that Disney do, but... Well, you know, I guess I still understand the world because I can still talk about this stuff with a relatively decent understanding. She is, however, allowed to watch... Dory is a big favourite in our Of course, there's there nothing wrong with Dory. Totally fine. You know, yes. Frozen is huge, Moana is yeah. totally fine. Yeah, no, yeah. there's some good ones, but there are some great ones. mainly... I imagine that's because, with the exception of Dory, because I've not actually seen it, but Moana and Frozen are both propaganda films for feminism because in both those films, every girl is the absolute pinnacle just she doesn't need any help she's just the hero she they're mary sues basically and then uh the men are just useless greedy oafs basically they're not that helpful if they are good guys and if they're bad guys they're just caricatures of evil people i mean honestly i'll leave links in the description to uh john peterson talking about frozen and i can't remember the guy's name but he made a youtube video about 15 minutes long analyzing every bit of symbolism in Moana and it is literally just everything to do everything that's masculine is just either frowned upon destroyed or laughed at whereas everything feminine is put on a pinnacle basically it's well worth a watch and I will leave it in the description anyway back to uh, Kira Knightley who as we can tell up to now doesn't want her daughter sticking to any feminist gender stereotypes and also lets her do what she wants so let's see what she has to say about halloween costumes so uh and your daughter is is what is she going to be for halloween by the way oh i don't know i think she wants to be a witch which i think is a bit boring like before she was three and a half we just got to dress her up so we just dress her as you know the stupidest thing that we could find normally very pink and like horrific but now she wants to be a witch and and so that's going to be a bit dull but like cute okay so you're against watching disney films because they give gendered bad stereotype roles to females in your view but you're still gonna dress her up in pink for when she's one and two for halloween okay and then she wants to be a witch and you're kind of off the idea and after this ellen gives her a lion dentist outfit to put on her for halloween so now she doesn't even have a choice what she dresses up for halloween which is still a nice gesture and i want to make it clear i actually quite like Kira knightley but this interview just absolutely i just had to talk about it, it was terrible and she isn't even the only feminist that doesn't understand Disney films, as we will get into. Such as this one. Kristen Bell drags Disney Snow White into Me Too. The storyline in Snow White has attracted criticism from the Me Too movement, after an actress said that the Disney version encouraged men to kiss women without their consent. Ugh, oh, sigh. Kristen Bell, actress and voice of Princess Anne in Frozen, said that the manner in which the prince kissed the sleeping Snow White was weird and she has warned her daughter about the male character behaviours. Oh my god, Kira Knightley has stopped her three-year-old daughter, Eddie, from watching some Disney films including Cinderella, The Little Mermaid, to encourage her independence. I've already gone through those two, but I will have a bit of a rant about Snow White. So, let's go through some of the symbolism in Snow White. Right, so you have Snow White at the start of the film. In rags, stepdaughter to the queen, beautiful woman, but, you know, again, in a shit situation. She can't do anything with her life, because, again, the wicked stepmother is supposed to be a tyrannical mother, okay? Prince comes along. This is a chance for Snow White to really understand that she can get out of this shit situation, has an alternative if she marries the prince, maybe. And she obviously falls in love with him, because as he's singing, she's all like, oh my god, I love him, and then sends a dove down to him to show that she kind of loves him. And the point of this is, right... Obviously, they don't get to know each other and don't have conversations, but it's stereotypes so that it's an easy story to understand, all right? And obviously, kids will want this one day, but the odds of them finding a Prince Charming are slim to none. And when they're older, they understand that it's symbolism. Okay. She ends up with the sweat Seven Dwarves, where she ends up cleaning their terrible house, because it's all, you know, men who are minors, and they're not going to be, you know, the tidiest of people. Anyway, fast forward a few scenes and you have the wicked stepmother who looks in the mirror is like oh 
well, Snow White's obviously still alive and still the most beautiful person in the land. I have to kill her. So she poisons an apple, dresses up as a hag, goes over there and poisons her and says, and then obviously she can only get out with a true love's first kiss, which the prince then goes on a, a bit of a quest to find her and then kiss her while she sleeps. Now, obviously, you're not supposed to kiss a woman while she is asleep. But the point is, is that it's exaggerating the fact that the prince has saved her life from a shit situation with the queen by bringing her back to life, having her reborn as this whole new Snow White who is now a princess, all right? It's everyone's dream to leave their situation, kind of die off from that situation and be reborn into a new and better one. That is the point of Snow White. You're taking it far too literally, and I think you need to understand deep symbolism behind Disney films instead of just looking at it purely through a feminist lens, because it is pissing me off. These are good films, and they have really good stories behind them and really good messages behind them, but no, you're taking it in one direction and saying, oh, by the way, uh, men are rapists, by the way. This prince, mm, this prince that the princess loves, mm, rapist. Mm. Like, come on, grow up. I know I'm a grown man talking about Disney films, but, you know, you get my... Carrying on with the article, because she makes an absolute moron of herself, Belle, 38, said that she had read bedtime stories to her daughter, Lincoln, 5, and Delta, 3, what, what absolute pedantic names, every night, but had a conversation with them about the plot of Snow White. She told Parents Magazine, don't you think it's weird that the princess kisses Snow White without her permission, because you cannot kiss someone if they're sleeping? She was dead! The whole point is that she was dead and only could come back to life with the prince's first kiss. Imagine that! Imagine if she's like, yeah, you saved my, my life, but you kissed me without permission, so sexual harassment, get out of my life. No, she obviously loved him. That was made clear in the plot. She also suggested that the storyline would encourage children to speak to strangers. Oh my god, every time we close Snow White, I look at my girls and ask, don't you think it's weird that Snow White didn't ask the old witch why she needed to eat the apple, or where she got the apple? I say, I would never take food from a stranger, would you? And the kids are like, no. That's the point of the story! She literally died from eating the apple! Yes, it is weird she did that, because she's naive and she's supposed to be. That's the point in the story. Oh my god, these women annoy the crap out of me. Next, we will move on to Louise O'Neill, an Irish feminist who rewrote The Little Mermaid. In this interview, it's actually with on a panel with Jordan Peterson and other people, just talking generally about Jordan Peterson's book. Uh, if you want to hear my analysis on that, there, I made a video called John Peterson's Conquest of the UK Media, and it's, uh, you know, I'd say it's worth a watch, but I'm just going on about her in this video, and I mainly got about Peterson in the other one, but it's worth a watch, so. But in the meantime, Little Mermaid from a Feminist. Mm -hmm. um, Louise, I want to come on to you, because you, you've written a book about suffering. I mean, it is mostly mm. about uh, a, a woman's suffering. Mm. Why did you want to rewrite this particular tale? Um, well, I suppose I was really fascinated by the story as, um, as a child. Um, the Disney version came out in 1989. Um, I was four years of age um, and I think it was the first Disney princess in 30 years and she sort of imprinted um, herself onto the psyche of an entire generation um, of young women. But it was as a teenager, I think, when I began to identify um, as a feminist that I started to look at that story and other fairy tales as well through a more critical lens, I suppose. Um, Critical meaning postmodern neo Marxist, as most feminists nowadays are, if they are intersectional, which this woman clearly is. Um, and I could see aspects of it that I found deeply problematic. Um, and I suppose for me, um, I began to suffer with anorexia um, at the age of 15. Um, and I had um, kind of oscillated between anorexia and bulimia for most of my teenage years and well into my 20s. And I started to wonder about the social messaging you know, contained within stories like these fairy tales where it was that you have to change your physical appearance in order that a man will love you. Um, and the idea of, I suppose, attaining that sometimes unattainable ideal of beauty in order to win that love, um, I, I suppose I just find that really dark messaging, especially to be telling young young children. Totally agree. I don't think you should be telling people that they have to attain a perfect body image to be happy in life. But as I went through before, that wasn't the point in the film or the fairy tale. The point was to get away from tyrannical parents that wouldn't let her explore. The idea was that she was trying to gain independence and that she got help and happened to fall in love with a prince. Because in all these stories, the prince is supposed to be kind of the vision of liberty. It's supposed to show that there is a better life out there for you and it's all 
kind of put up on this prince and it doesn't necessarily have to be a prince it's just the easiest way i think for girls to understand it because i mean what girl doesn't want to be a princess i mean i don't know a single girl that didn't want to be a princess when she was younger i mean sure even tomboys did want to be a princess once they, when they were younger i mean i know many tomboys that wanted to be princesses when they were younger but i mean honestly to just put all this down to oh they have to change themselves to being a man if that's the message you got from the little mermaid then you didn't look at it through a critical lens you looked at it through a feminist lens that dichotomizes men and women which i don't think is how the real world works um well it has to say it's a, it, it's a dark ending to your you haven't replaced it with a as it were a positive and light <laughs> well world. i thought it was much more empowering actually um but um yeah you know it's funny i think that in life i tend to, to be a bit of a pollyanna but sometimes when i write when i sit down to write i think all of the darkness comes out um, and a lot of that is just you know experience just as a woman living in the world um, i do want to mention earlier in this interview she did mention that men commit suicide more successfully and yet she's going on about how it's bad for women i mean at least women are don't want to kill themselves as much as men <laughs> i think the statistics actually are women try and commit suicide more but men succeed more and i i think you're kind of missing the point there that women expect to get help there or or men are just better at committing suicide i actually think it's a mixture of both but I think she's being a bit disingenuous to say that like dark thoughts come out because she's a woman living in the world. I think, I mean, as she says, she had mental health problems when she was younger. I think she's just still getting through that basically, which I feel bad for her. Don't get me wrong, but I think to put it all down to the little mermaid is a bit silly in my opinion. It's hard not to feel that. One of the things I thought was interesting about your retelling of it was that it does uh, unleash um, a sense of revenge. Mm. it doesn't shy away from vengeance yeah. you, one of your characters say I will flay the skin from the bones of men like yeah. my father well, I will tear them apart and I will eat them raw <laughs> Jordan's about to kill me <laughs> I'm so scared please help me well he may have he may have things to say about uh, it. Yeah. I have bloody things to say about it first first of all I've just gone on to Amazon to check out one of the book reviews and I'm just going to read out the whole damn thing because it sounds bloody awful. So, spoiler, the male characters in this book, all male characters, are flawed and the villain. Gaia is, I don't know how to say that, father is controlling and possessive, Oliver is irresponsible and selfish, and Rupert is abusive and regularly sexually harasses girls. George was the only one who seemed nice throughout the whole book, but at the end he takes home a drunk girl. Arguably, you could even say that Oliver's father was a villain for cheating on his wife. The girls, on the other hand, though slightly flawed as well, all come out as heroes. Gaia's sister comes to save her, their mother never wanted to leave them and came back for her daughters, even the sea witch turns out to help Gaia, and Eleanor ends up being a victim of men's actions. That's not the way the world works, there are mean girls and nice boys. And then obviously in this book there is a line saying, I'm going to flay the skin off of men, which, alright, fine, I understand wanting to take revenge on people who have wronged you, but this whole story seems to just try and show the world to be entirely terrible for women. I mean, not even Disney films do that. And as I said before, Disney films are probably the best type of films for kids to see because they hold inherently true messages behind them, behind the symbolism. But this whole one just has a symbolism that is entirely distorted and shows the world to just be a terrible place if you happen to be born with a vagina. Yeah, well, it was um, it was when I was doing um, research, I came across um, the Rusalka, which is um, in Slavic mythology. And it is young women who died in very tragic circumstances. So maybe they were jilted at the altar or they were drowned because they became um, pregnant with an unwanted child. Um, and for me, as was growing up in Ireland, um, a country in which the church and the state conspired for so long to police women's sexualities um, and bodies. Um, I, I saw some parallels between that and that's b between the Magdalens, you know, the women who were basically enslaved in the Magdalen laundries um, and in the uh, mother and baby homes. Um, and I suppose in Ireland coming up to the referendum at the end of this month yes to legalise abortion um, in this country it felt like a moment I suppose of an attempt to make reparations to the women of the past so maybe that's a better way of putting it than revenge <laughs> <laughs> reparations by flaying the skin off men that have mistreated you yeah no that's that's reparations that's not revenge that's reparations Jesus Christ in fact, John Peterson's going to say something that is absolutely fantastic that just puts everything into words that the feminists actually want with Disney films, pretty much. Um, so I'm just going to let him talk for the next couple of minutes. Um, Jordan Peterson, you can't, you can't object to that entirely because your book writes specifically about revenge and a sense of vengeance and, and the moments at which 
it is reasonable to to release that. Well, it's not that easy to discriminate between the desire for revenge and the desire for justice. It's a very tight and fine line to draw. And so, and you know, obviously justice is something worth pursuing, but I suppose justice is minimal necessary force to put things right, and revenge is taking it farther than that. And it risks spiraling out of control, which it tends to do. Mm. Um, but, it, but it's reasonable, isn't it, for women who find themselves in a position that they regard as unjust to take, to take kind of quite strong actions? Well, I've, ne I've yeah. never said anything in the book that would, re would ask people not to stop transforming societies in a positive direction. Like I said, the fact that I describe the existence of hierarchies outside the human realm and point out that you can't attribute the existence of hierarchies to any particular political system doesn't mean that I justify the facts of their existence or am ignorant about their shortcomings. Um, you do write about revenge like this, though. You say, you say at one point in the book, when should you start pushing back against oppression despite the danger? When you start nursing secret fantasies of revenge, when your life is being poisoned and your imagination fills with the wish to devour and destroy. I was struck by that because it seems to take symptoms of uh, an individual disorder, a paranoia, really, something quite dangerous, and endorse it as a description of the world at large. No, it just points out that when you walk home from work and you're thinking about violent things in relationship to your boss that you probably have something to say that you should have said a long time ago. And you have to pay attention to those dark fantasies that build at the back of your imagination because they tell you when you're not being courageous enough in your life and are building up the kind of resentment that could explode outward and destroy things. It's no justification for it. It's an observation again. I think to summarize, these films are made for kids. These films have to be easy for kids to understand. Every child knows what a prince and a princess is. Every child knows that prince and princesses tend to be good people, especially when they are obviously displayed as good people, as they are in every Disney film. The queens tend to be terrible people, and then in the, all these new films, it's not going to confuse kids, but it's going to give kids a message that is inherently anti-everything that they will understand. The messages behind Frozen are terrible, you know, the fact that they don't need men. The messages behind Moana are uh, I mean, I agree with some of them, to be honest, but some of them are terrible because it... I mean, in Moana, basically, they're all, they autistically have to stay on the island. Like, all the men are just like, no no exploring whatsoever. And then the, woman's, uh, the woman Moana obviously tries to go off and explore Outland because they have to. And it just shows the men making absolute... taking no risks whatsoever. And it's like, fine, yeah, obviously you're supposed to do that, but in terms of symbolism, right, it's usually going to be a man doing that, but... You know, in Moana, it's a woman, and I don't really, you know, they're changing the gender of who would usually do something. Like, who cares? But it's then when she meets the demigod, and he's just this massive prick, basically, who's just really egotistical. It just shows every man is being bad and no woman is being good. I mean, the men just don't take risks, and the women are the ones doing everything, which, all right, you could argue, <laughs> you know, that's happening in every other Disney film, but it hasn't, because what type? Because what would you call sacrificing your boys, boys to get legs to an unknown world on the surface? I'd call that a fucking risk. So no, that you can't even say that. So to be quite honest, the Disney films are great, and I think they show your kids a really good message. But banning them from watching it and having conversations about things that are obvious in them anyway, like come on, these people need to grow up. But in the meantime, that's everything I had to say on this, so thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.